Hello and welcome to Art and Self. I'm Cindy Ingram, your host and the founder of Art Class Curator, the Curated Connections Library, and the Art and Self Connection Circle. This is a podcast where we experience the range and depth of what it means to be human, seen through our connections and conversations about works of art. These art conversations are here to show you that art is here for you as a catalyst, a challenger, a coach, and a comfort. Before we get started, take a moment to fill up your lungs with a deep breath. Connect with your body and your mind and your spirit and get ready to discover what art has to show you. I am so excited to welcome Amy Weinbarger to the podcast. Welcome, Amy. Hi. So excited to have you here and I'm so excited to see you again. Before we get started, can you introduce yourselves for our our listeners? Hi, my name is Dr. Amy Weinbarger. I am an astrophysicist and a rocket scientist. I work for NASA and I talk about science all day, every day. <laughs> and so I was really excited when Cindy asked me to be on the podcast because I don't normally get to talk about art. So this is a very big thing for me. It'd be very exciting. Yeah. And I feel kind of the same way. I love science, and but I talk about art all day. <laughs> so I'm like, this will be such a fun way to combine our, our interests so I'm going to show you four works of art and or five. I have five for you. And I'm going to tell you the, I'm going to show them to you. I'm going to say the titles and the artists so that our listeners can know what I'm showing you. But I don't, I don't want you to spend too much time on the title part. Just really look at the picture, whatever calls to you, whatever feels like you really want to talk about it. And then you'll choose one and then we will talk about it. And I had such a funny time trying to pick art for this podcast because you know, a lot of like space art was very literal. It was like, here's a spaceship and some <laughs> stars. There are, you know, it was all, it was like, well, how are we going to really have a conversation about that? So I had to really dig deep. I got some amazing feedback from people in our Art and Self Facebook group uh, for some artists to look for. And so I'm excited to share with you what we have. So let me get it going on the screen. So I went for lots of different directions. So you'll see they're all very different. So the first one is The Love Embrace of the Universe, The Earth, Myself, Diego, and Senor Exolotl by Frida Kahlo. And let's see, the second one is Union by Chris Wade, who I talked to on Facebook is local to you. Oh, wow. Cool. Um, we have The Weather Project by Olafar Eliasson. And we have Action Painting 2 by Mark Tanzi. And thank you to Devin Calvert for the suggestion on Facebook. And then Universal Truth by Allison and Christian. Any of those look oh, interesting wow. to you? Wow. Um, I am really torn. I really liked the one that you just showed. And I thought that I was going to choose that one. But then the last one, I think I like even more. But this this one is a very literal one, right? This one is yeah. a, a, the shuttle taking off. And people mm -hmm. are pumping the shuttle taking off. And I love this one because it has a, has a, <laughs> has a launch in it. I love launches. And I love that people are painting it and, and artists are making art out of the shuttle taking off. It is, I feel like I have to choose this one because I want to talk about it, but I really <laughs> love the last one too. The last one I think makes, is more abstract, obviously. Mm -hmm. And it calls to me because it's so abstract and I love the colors and I love the woman reaching up into the swirl. Oh gosh, Cindy, I don't know. Which one do you <laughs> Oh no, it's not. Oh goodness. Oh, no one's ever asked me that. I think <laughs> I think you have to choose. <laughs> Cuz I wouldn't have put it up there if I didn't think we had anything to talk about. So. Ah, oh, wow. I really I think we have to talk about this one. But can we just spend like 5 minutes or 4 minutes on the one before because I sure. love the picture so much. Yeah, that's I love it. I love that we're going to do that. Yeah, this so one this, is really this, one, this cool. one so speaks to me. Just just the image and what it. I mean, I'm, I can I just go off on this. I'm sorry. Do it, please. <laughs> because I mean, so so the the picture is there's a the space shuttle is taking off. So there's a rocket going up, and the space shuttle is on the rocket. You know how they used to launch the shuttle. Um, there's a big. Uh, cloud there's a you know the fire coming out the bottom of the rocket then there's a big cloud at the base and then there are several people in the foreground who are making this as a painting and they're standing around and also in the foreground is the is the clock the the, the seconds that have passed since 
the launch and it's at plus eight seconds. So launch has just happened and it's eight seconds after. Now, normally when I launch rockets, eight seconds after, you can't see the rocket anymore. It's gone because the rockets I launch are very fast. With a shuttle, it would, you know, if you ever saw yeah. a shuttle launch, it would be like boom, boom, boom. And it would just be like <laughs> the shuttle would just kind of stay there and then it would kind of slowly work its way up, much slower than the kind of rockets I, I go. There's an American flag in the, the image. There's a, a lake and all these people are painting and they're capturing. And it's, I mean, it, kind of the interesting thing is they all have a picture of the shuttle going off as exactly as the sh shuttle is going off. So yeah. it, it's like they've captured it in, in, in a microsecond, that, that image of the shuttle going off. So that's, that. I mean, it's so that's kind of interesting to me that all these people are are painting this image and they've captured it already like right? they've already got on their canvases the image of the shuttle going off exactly at that second that the shuttle is at that place obviously not realistic they couldn't be painting it because you know <laughs> it takes time to paint things and it doesn't happen instantaneously but yeah but i love i love this the fact that people are making art out of this launch i mean this is this one is really calling to me i'm sorry <laughs> i love the <laughs> next one too but um, maybe maybe this is the one amy yeah, maybe this is it. What are your thoughts on this one? <laughs> well, what I love about it is that it's kind of a commentary on on painting too, because uh, the I told you not to pay attention to the titles, but here I am going to talk about the title. I'm like breaking my my cardinal rule, but um, action painting is like a type of painting like Jackson Pollock or like the abstract expressionists, where they would sort of like you know move their bodies and, and paint really quickly. And so this artist, a lot of his paintings are him. Um, using kind of humor with like traditional art art words and 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 criticism and things like that, and it's like it's making it look like they're these sort of impressionist painters out in the landscape, you know, you know, painting the light. But instead, they've managed to capture this like perfect rendition of a launch in eight seconds. And one of them even has he's been painting so long that he's standing back looking at it, like what is he going to paint next? You know, I think I think there's a lot of humor in this one too, which is what drew me to it. Right. Yeah. It's it's like one of those scenes where people are painting the water lilies. Yeah. Right. They're that it's that kind of a scene. It's all monochromatic. It's all kind of green. I don't know. I really, really like this. I might have to get this and put it up on my wall because I, <laughs> so, um, I, re I'm, I really, I don't know, but as a scientist, this really calls to me. And the fact that the people are excited about this. There's so many people looking at the launch and, and excited about it and making art of it. I just, I just love that. Yeah. Okay. So you said, so we're going to kind of go in and out of talking about like your work and the art, but you said the types of, of rockets you launch are much faster. Can you talk about the right. types of rockets you launch? Because that really made me want to ask. <laughs> I want to know more. Sure. Sure. So I launch, they're called sounding rockets. So they're basically, we, we build instruments that look at the sun. I, I am a solar physicist, so I, I, I'm an astrophysicist, but you know the sun is a star, so I, I can look at the sun <laughs> as an astrophysicist. And so I build instruments that, that go up above our atmosphere and look at the sun in wavelengths of light that can't make it through our atmosphere. So ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, and X-ray wavelengths of light. So we build rockets, telescopes that look at the sun at those wavelengths of light. So we, we put them on, so we build the instrument and then we mount the instrument to very fast rocket and the rocket, just like I said, you light it and then boom, it goes, it goes straight up. It's so much faster than these are, but then we, it, when we launch it, we get about five minutes worth of data where we, so we, we go up above the atmosphere, we open the door to the telescope so we can look at the sun. We point to the sun, we look at the sun for about five minutes, then we close the door and the instrument comes back down. The rocket motors at that point have ejected, they're, they're spent. So the instrument by itself comes back down. It has a parachute on it. So hopefully as it gets lower and lower, the parachute will open and it will gently land on the ground. Sometimes <laughs> the parachute doesn't open. And when the parachute doesn't open, you don't get your instrument back because it's, you know, it, it, it lands ballistically. And so it just goes uh, way, way into the, into the earth. But that, but that's what I do. That's my job is I build these instruments and we launch them on rockets and we get to look at the sun in those wavelengths. So the data that you get, you only get five minutes of data before it comes crashing back. That's right. So, and oh my you know, the crazy thing is it can. So I'll give you an example. We just launched a rocket last year, 2021. The name of the rocket was Magix. 
It doesn't really, you know, everything in NASA is an acronym, so it doesn't really matter what it stands for, but that Mm -hmm. was the name of the telescope. And we started, I started working at NASA in 2010, and I had a meeting about magics in October, like the week after I started working at NASA. And we, you know, we were talking about it. We were developing the concept 2010, 2011. We proposed in 2012. We got a little bit of money in 2012. Then we proposed again in 2014. We were selected in 2014 for a launch. From 2014 to 2021, we were building and testing and calibrating the instrument. And then we we were supposed to launch in May of 2020. And so, of course, we had to delay for a year because of COVID. So in July of 2021, we finally launched. So I was working on that instrument and that concept for 11 years (laughs) to get five minutes worth of data. I mean, it's really a labor of love. I, I absolutely love doing this. I mean, it's so much fun. Launching a rocket is is the most fun a scientist can have. Because normally, like for this is instance, this kind of a launch, like a, a shuttle launch or any kind of large launch like that, scientists might be invited to come and watch the launch, but you don't get to participate. You don't get to yeah. sit with a headset on. You don't get to call go or no go. But when you're launching a science rocket, like a sounding rocket, the scientists actually in the, the room with the headset on, they get to say go or no go. And then after the rocket gets up there, you only have these five minutes, right? So the scientist actually points the rocket in real time. So we choose a target and we will actually move like, move the rocket like with a joystick around so we can look at the target oh we're trying gosh. to look at. So it's very interactive and it's just like the most fun, the most exciting. It's like, you know, 15 minutes of terror. It's so much, <laughs> it's so great. And when it, when it works and it did, I mean, so this last launch, I was telling you about magic, so it did work. The instrument worked. The data looked amazing. You get to see things that no one else has ever seen. So when I and when I first started working at NASA, like I said, I was starting to work on this instrument called Magix, which just launched. But we were already the, the group here was already working on a different instrument called High C, and that instrument took the highest resolution images of the solar corona that had ever been taken, and it flew in 2000. Oh, I think it was 2012. The first flight was in 2012. We've flown it several times since then. But it first flew, I think, in 2012 in July, like July 5th, 2012. So we launched the rocket. The rocket comes down. Now, high sea came back down, but it when rockets come down, you know, not only did the, does the parachute have, have to open, but the rockets usually spin like a barrel roll. Mm-hmm. And as they spin, it dissipates heat. So high sea, when it came down, it came down flat, which meant it got hot all on one side of the rocket. And as a result, it burnt a hole in the rocket skin. And so when we came down, we got it back and everything. But that hole <laughs> it meant that we couldn't easily get the data off the hard drive. So it took us a long time. So we get that. We finally, you know, we sit there, we wait and we, we're working on it. We get the data off the hard drive. But by that time, everybody's ready to go home. It's been a really long day. <laughs> and usually after a, ro- a rocket launch, you all go out to dinner. And so the whole group was going out to dinner. And so I, I I was in the car. I had one of my colleagues in the back seat. Another colleague was driving and I was in the car and I plugged the data into my laptop. And on the way home from White Sands Missile Range to Las Cruces, New Mexico, I was typing, you know, analyzing this data. And one of the things that we were trying to see in this data was the braiding of the sun's corona. So we were trying to see these very small structures and we were looking for these little, these little braided structures in the, the images. And we saw them and that, that was, I, I think this was the first time that these types of images were ever seen. Definitely for mm-hmm. in the corona, there have been other wavelengths of light in other parts of the sun that you can see them, but in the corona, this is the first time. And so I, I told my colleagues, we got it. We got the images. We got what we were looking for. I was the first, <laughs> my first eyeball saw them. We wrote a nature paper on that data. I mean, it is just the coolest job ever. And I love it. I mean, I'm so glad that I, I kind of stumbled into doing rocket launches. That wasn't something that I did in graduate school or an undergraduate. I came to it mid-career, but it was the best thing. I'm so glad that I came to it because it is so much fun. Yeah. Oh gosh, your story. I'm like so excited. I don't even, like I'm like, my whole body's like jittering. I'm just like, yeah. oh, I can't believe that. <laughs> all of that. But it's just it ha- like you worked so hard for it. And then that it was just during that, like the short period of time. I mean, yeah, it sounds like it was so, worth it. 
So this, <laughs> it was every, believe me, we learned something new about our universe, about atoms, about, we learn something new every time we fly something that, that when it works, I mean, if it doesn't work, <laughs> we don't learn. But so the, the, the last instrument that we flew, we were looking at the x-ray sun, the, the high, high C was looking at the extreme ultraviolet sun. The last instrument we flew, we were looking at x-rays. And we were an instrument that's very similar to an instrument called Chandra. Maybe you heard of this Chandra Observatory, which takes images of the, the universe. They have these beautiful images of all the different galaxies. They're so pretty. You should look those up, Chandra Observatory. But we have an instrument that's very similar to Chandra. And Chandra has been flying for like 20 years. And in our little five minutes of date, so we, we thought that I mean, we thought we were going to take some solar data that was kind of analogous to the Chandra data. Now, Chandra was built to look at away from the sun. Mm -hmm. It can't look at the sun. The sun is a very bright thing in the sky. So if you're built to look at astrophysical objects, you don't look at the sun. (laughs) So we were looking at the sun. So we thought, okay, we're going to take this like analogous data to Chandra. We're not going to find anything new. I mean, in, in terms of like the atomic spectra and things about the atoms. And it turns out we did because Chandra's always looking at these very bright and hot stars that are very far away. But we look at our sun and our sun has structures that aren't that hot, that are cooler. And by looking at those cooler structures, we learned some information about the atomic spectra and x-rays that we didn't know. And so that was super exciting. So every launch you learn something new and it's just really fun to discover it. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time. But man, is it is it a great job? Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know what's so cool though is that now I completely understand why you chose this artwork. Because when I was choosing, I was like, should I go like mystical? Should I go? I mean, I know I should I do this on, but like the energy and excitement of the rocket piece. I guess I hadn't thought about how really exciting that must be. That's so cool. Right. And, I'm, and I'm totally a launch. Um, what do we call that? Like a groupie? Like I want to go to every launch. I love <laughs> launches. I mean, I love the launches where I have to be the lead. And so I have to wear the headset and say, no, go, go, no, go. Those are really fun. But it's even more fun to watch other people do it because it's not stressful. <laughs> so I can like enjoy the atmosphere without having the, any responsibility. So I go to lots and lots of launches. As many launches I'll, as, as I can, I'll go. How many launches do they have like in a year? For sounding rockets, we have, well, before COVID, it was like 18 to 20 a year. Oh, wow. Um, you know, during COVID, it was very uh, few. And then, and now that kind of we're ramping back up, now we have a huge number because we had a backlog during COVID. Right. Oh, man. Oh, that's and exciting. Launch, like, you know, the launch of the shuttle, of course, we don't launch the shuttle anymore, but we just had the Artemis launch. I wish I could have yeah. gone to that. There's lots of other launches that happen for bigger rockets, but for sounding rockets, it's about 18. Okay. Well, that's good that you don't. You don't have to truly wait like, you know, 10 years from one launch to another. You get right to now. I try to at least make one a year and one of my own and hopefully one of somebody else's a year. Yeah. You know, something that was when you were talking that I noticed in the artwork is, you know, how your rocket goes up there and you have such a quick time to get your data, but you've spent so much time. And then that I looked at the art artist down at the bottom of this picture and they've painted all of that in such a quick time and I, I thought you know that that um time piece the contrast of how much time it took to get that rocket in the air is not eight seconds it's years upon years upon years upon years yes um, exactly I mean especially a rocket like this I mean so for sounding rockets um at NASA we accept failure so we ex- I mean we don't want failure of course but mm-hmm. we are not afraid to fail and, you know, and, and for human spaceflight, failure is not an option. That is our famous <laughs> line from NASA. And yeah. so it, so all of the human spaceflight rockets and all the large rockets, there's a, there's a, it's much longer and there's so many more people involved and a lot of quality and safety. And for sounding rockets, because we're relatively cheap and we're, we are a cutting edge in terms of the instruments mm-hmm. we're building. And it's just instrumentation. It's not human life. We allow ourselves to, to try new things and to fail. One of our sounding rocket, the chiefs for, for, for many years, Phil Eberspeaker would once famously said, the sounding rocket program is the NASA that NASA has forgotten how to be. So back in when oh. we were doing the Apollo era, when we were launching to the moon, you know, NASA took lots of risks. They did lots of crazy stuff. They were trying all kinds of stuff. They were building, you know, carbon filters out of all the random crap they could find in the, in the, in that little, uh, the capsule. 
but but NASA now is much more safety conscious. Obviously, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, as of it course. should be, I mean, uh, of course. <laughs> but but really yeah, to, to be at the, in the part of NASA that still is at that bleeding edge and taking lots of risk. And uh, that's yeah, absolutely. I love that. And, and th- that's a great juxtaposition. Like you said, we've got this rocket and this shuttle, which probably took 10 years to put together and to build. We launch it. The launches go so fast. I mean, even Artemis. I mean, we just saw Artemis launch. It went around the moon. It was on a 25 day mission. Just splashed down what last Saturday or Sunday. I cannot believe it was up there for 25 days because it felt like it had just launched. You know, time yeah. seems like it goes so quickly, but here they've captured the the rocket launch and uh, instantaneously at T plus eight seconds. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, and I love how every painting is the same. Like they, no one, there's no abstract paintings. There's no like every one is just a realistic <laughs> portrayal yeah. of the exact same scene, and I just. It's fascinating that, to me. That's that's interesting. I mean, you, that that's obviously a choice that the artist made that they'll yeah. all be painting exactly the same painting. Um, that's an interesting, you know, choice. It would have been interesting if 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 is this a, a male artist or it is, yeah. Okay, if, if he had chosen to make the you know slightly different between the different paintings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I noticed like I didn't notice this before because I try not to spend a lot of time with these before I show them to you so that I kind of come in fresh too, but I didn't notice that there were children painting too. And there was like, and this woman is like lounging, like she's the subject of a painting, but she's somehow managing right. to paint. There's all sorts of different you, things happening. Do you think it's a commentary though? On, you know, the people are so different, but the paintings are all the same. That like science is the same for everybody, independent of who you are and independent of how you dress and your age, science is the same. I mean, science is, if you want to believe in truth, I mean, I, I feel like we're getting into something that's very heavy, but if you want I know, to believe I love in it. something, <laughs> you have to believe in science and science, they, they've painted this all identically, even though they're all very unique. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting because art is, is, well, and the fact too, that this is black and white, um, and the people seem kind of old fashioned, you know, they look like maybe people from the, they seem to me like uh, Norman Rockwell type figures, you know, like fifties yeah. in their suits and they're just like prim, like there's no like racial diversity in here. There's no, you know, it's like, right. it's very much feels like, well, that's the era of, of action painting was in the fifties and sixties. So that, that does make sense. Um, where was I yeah. going to go with that? Oh yeah. The fact that they're all like, no one is doing anything revolutionary. No one is doing anything different. And then that's, I mean, that art, that's the, the oppor- that's your opportunity to, to do something different and to, or maybe it's reverence for the science, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing because I, um, I, I don't know, like it's, I, I'm kind of captivated by that now. <laughs> I can't think of anything else. But they're all identical, and yet the, yeah. the people are the people are so different. But at the same time, you're right. There's no racial diversity. There's there's I mean, there are women and men and children, but yeah. they're all you know white. They're like the guy's wearing a suit. They you know look I don't know mm-hmm. wealthy ish like wealthy wealthy white people. Yeah. It almost looks like even the wo- woman on the far, I think she's a woman. It's hard to tell. She's, it's someone sitting and she's got the canvas in her lap, but it looks like she's in there like a fur coat or something. Like it just looks, looks fancy. And then the little girl, uh, the like, far left there? Yeah, like right oh, here. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So going with the, like, this is deep thing, but you mentioned. Oh, I, can I, can I, I'm sorry. I guess yes, had a, a, a thought I want to say before I forget, Do like it. when you're saying that, you know, that, that they're all the same and art art is an ability to have some different expressions, mm-hmm. but maybe, maybe it's the science, maybe it's the shuttle that is the art in this, this painting. Maybe it's mm. the, that is the expression. That is the expression of, I, I, I don't even know what, that is the expression of beauty or the expression yeah. of truth. And, and that is what is the art, if that makes sense. It is because my whole body got chills. So I know (laughs) (laughs) I agree with you because you can, I have the physical proof. Um, Yeah. Like it is, it's it's a, it's a culmination of humanity of, and that's what art is. It's like you expressing your humanity. It's you like putting who you are in and creating something new out of nothing. And that's Mm -hmm. what you're, that's what you're doing. You're, 
you're innovating, you're being creative, you're problem solving. That's the very essence of what humanity is. You're right. making that's tools what, that's and what using the them. Is. That's, the, that's what yeah. the shuttle is doing. It's it's that it's, the shuttle is the creativity. So it's captured in all of these artworks. Oh, now I'm, I'm getting excited about it. <laughs> I know, me too. <laughs> I've been excited the whole time though. I'm just like, science. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I love that. Isn't it this interesting now that we chose this one because this one is probably the most literal and relative mm -hmm. to what I do. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, I, I, I as a scientist, I, I don't want to be literal. Literal. I, I don't want to be, you know, I, as with art, I don't want to be something that is just like you have to have. Like you're saying, most most science art is very like there's the planets or there's the juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. There's the sun. This is there's the mean, astronaut the way, longingly before. looking out into space. Yeah. yeah. There's some beautiful things like that. I mean, they're oh, yeah. beautiful artworks and I, and I love, there's like, you know, there's a program in solar physics that goes into schools and works with students and kind of really tries to, to make art, make the sun mm -hmm. into art. And then as a way teaching them about the sun, as we talk about the sun and they make art about the sun, we kind of combine exactly. all that together. And so we, we try to really, you know, I mean, I embrace that, that there's some very kind of simple art that is beautiful and very literal, but I was really thinking that I would choose a little, something a little more abstract for this. And so it's really, I feel like I, I went for the safe choice with this art piece. But no, because then that, I think, I think what was happening is this one captivated you the most. This one made you the most excited, but you were over, your thinking brain was like, no, I should choose something that's a little more abstract. And so you were like, but this is the one that gave you that like visceral body reaction that made you excited. Yeah. And that, that means it's the right, the right choice. This is the one that I want on my wall. Yeah. <laughs> and that I want to look at every day. Whereas uh, the other ones were beautiful, but this one is the one that I would, I would choose to, to print out and keep. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm really excited that, that we found one that did give you that excitement. And that's so cool. So I have a question because you've mentioned this, this a few times you've used the word truth and I am captivated by the concept of truth because I used to work at a classical school and in, in, in our, we had this like school slogan. There's like, I will love what is true. I will something, what is good something was beautiful. And I came in on the first day and I'm like, I don't think truth exists. I don't know the beauty exists. I don't know, you know, I don't know the goodness exists. And they're all just like, oh, you know, they're all just like shocked <laughs> at me. And then last night, uh, oddly enough, I was watching a show on Netflix called, um, uh, I would have known it if I wouldn't put it on the spot, something to infinity. It was about infinity. Okay. And so they, I don't know, have you seen it? It's really, it was yeah, really cool. But they were, they were talking to mathematicians about infinity. And then they were talking to physicists about infinity. They were talking to philosophers about infinity. And it was like, they didn't necessarily agree and like what was real and what was possible when it comes to infinity. And so then I'm like, so that's my long way of saying, does truth exist? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Truth exists. Can we know it is a different question. Can we ever know it or comprehend it? And that's the question I don't know the answer to. That, that's a, maybe a no. But absolutely, truth exists. There are principles and th th that guide our universe that that we are trying to understand and tap into. We have tried clumsily over decades. I mean, centuries. We've 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 been expanding our knowledge of the universe since humans existed. Yeah, and we are progressively getting closer and closer to the truth, but. Can we ever get there? Will there always be a gap? And I think there might be. I mean, I, I don't know that we can we can make that. But I do think that we can. So I, I basically what I'm saying is that we everything is a hypothesis. Everything yeah. is a hypothesis. Nothing is proven. But there are hypotheses that are been tested and tested and tested again, and they're still standing. And so those are the hypotheses that we have to believe in. But they may in the future be proven incorrect. And another hypothesis will become the leading hypothesis. And that's something that as scientists, we have to accept. Even if we feel like we're discovering something and learning something, and we are. I mean, I, I, I don't want to downplay what was happening mm -hmm. in, in science. So we are exploring and learning and, and growing our scientific knowledge. But we have to accept the fact that we are 
incomplete. Our, our knowledge is incomplete and in that we are incomplete humans. Our brains are limited in our ability to comprehend things. So we have to be our own critic. We have to, you know, even if I believe something wholeheartedly and emotionally, and I think this is the truth, I have to accept that that truth can be proven wrong. Even truths like I think things are not correct. I mean, I, I, I don't believe in things. I don't believe in things. I don't have proof mm. of them. I have, there's a hypothesis and it has no test to, to, in my, in my opinion that have proven it true. And those still might be correct. So I still have to accept that even things I don't believe in and don't believe are true could in the end be true as a scientist. You always have to keep your mind open to possibilities. So yes, I believe in absolute truth, but I don't think that we're there or maybe could ever get there. Could ever, yeah. And you know, as you were as you were talking and talking about the like how we've always been trying to figure it out since as far as we know. And it and I was kind of in my head going back all the way back to like ancient or like prehistoric people looking up at the sky trying to figure it out. And you know, at the same time, those same people were writing things down and draw or starting to draw pictures and starting to like that both science and art have always been a way to understand the world there. You're just going about it in different, different ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Galileo drew sunspots. That was a big thing that Galileo did. And he had, there are all these like hand drawn. So Galileo would look through, at the sun through a telescope and uh, not look at the eyeballs, but he would, yeah. the sun, he would draw the sunspots on the sun. And he watched the sunspots as they went across the sun and he measured the solar rotation that way. And he, so there are, it, there are these beautiful pictures that you can download. You can actually animate them and you can see how the sunspots move based on Galileo's so cool. drawing. But it was just such a neat thing that he used that. He, he drew the sun every day at the same time every day so he could measure things and make science, make science measurements and data out of them. I mean, there, there is some beautiful art, what I would consider art that comes out of scientific images and scientific theories and, and, yeah. and theorems. And, and, and there's, I mean, especially now NASA has gotten so great at animating when we think we've discovered something about an, an astronomical source that we can't easily image. NASA has become excellent at animating that so we can visualize it. And I think that's really powerful. That's something that, oh, that's yeah. really neat that's happened in the last you know, 20 years or so. For the sun, there's beautiful images of the sun. We don't have to animate it because we can take pictures of it close enough. We can see it. But yeah, I really, uh, so I don't, I don't know where we're going with that, but. I don't, I don't either. And that's what I love about it. <laughs> I'll just let it take us wherever it takes us. So we're, 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 we're talking about the combination of science and art. Yeah, I absolutely mm -hmm. think that that, and, and like the hieroglyphs, you know, people used to think that the sun rotated around the earth. And I'm mm -hmm. sure those were representative of some early hieroglyphs and they were trying to understand their world around them. And they did it by drawing and, and trying to explain things to one another and to the next generation, the same way mm -hmm. we do now. Yeah. I found an artwork when I was looking for art for you of a, uh, it was a realistic photographer and he was well, sur sur surreal photographer. So he edited photographs and made them surreal, but he had like a, it was like a flat earth and then the sun was on a pulley and the person was there pulling the sun up and I was like, it was really cool, but I didn't choose it. It, it came to mind when you were thinking about the ways to explain the world. So what made you want to be a scientist to begin with? I, well, I was always really good at math and science when I was in school, but I didn't know that I could do physics. I didn't know that I could be a physicist. I didn't really know what a physicist was. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're good at something and you feel good about it and you're in school and you're doing your homework and you understand it and just kind of clicking in your head, you think, okay, this is something I could do. And so I was really, I knew I was really good at math and I would, uh, I thought, okay, I'll be an accountant. I, that's before TikTok renamed what an accountant is. I knew I'll be an accountant. <laughs> and so, and, and, then, and then, you know, I, the, and then I took chemistry and I thought, oh man, chemistry was so neat and so fun. I really loved chemistry. I took AP chemistry and I thought, okay, I'll be a chemist. And then the senior year of high school, I took physics and mm -hmm. everything clicked. You know, it was just like, this is it. I found where I should be. And I, I knew at that point that that one day physics, I mean, physics to me was like, it had had the math, it had the cool stuff about chemistry, but it didn't have the explosions that you could have in the chemistry lab. So I thought this will be a safer <laughs> way. 
<laughs> I love the idea that we could explore uh, the world around us and better understand the world around us using physics. And my daughter is taking, my daughter's a freshman in high school and she's taking physics as a freshman, which I love. I love oh, how wow. high school is freshman. And so it's been so neat to talk to her about these basic concepts like displacement and velocity and acceleration, something that we all have some kind of, <clears throat> if you've ever dri ridden in a car or ridden on a roller coaster, you have, you know, your body knows you have an understanding of displacement, velocity, acceleration, but you have to really like think about it and think about like, if I'm moving backwards, what does that mean in terms of velocity? If I'm changing my speed, what does that mean in terms of acceleration? So I've been loving kind of revisiting those very basic concepts with her this year. And so then I went to college and I went to a small religious school in Tennessee. I'm from Tennessee. My parents, my mom and, and stepdad had not gone to college. And so I was kind of shoot blind about choosing a college. And I chose this religious college thinking, well, they have a physics major, so I should go there. <laughs> have a physics major. In the end, that probably wasn't the best idea. I probably should have gone to a technical school, but that's okay. You know, I, I had a great time there. It was, it was, it yeah. was a neat experience and it was a liberal arts college. So one of the things that I didn't know as a physicist is I spend about 90% of my time writing. And so I spend more time oh. writing than I, than I do like solving math problems. <laughs> so it's actually kind of good that I got a liberal arts degree because then I could, I could, I'm a better writer probably for it. Then I went to graduate school at University of Alabama in Huntsville, met my husband there. And that, it just kind of, you know, there was a moment, Cindy, when I was in graduate school so I, I went through this liberal arts college. Uh, the physics part of it probably wasn't the best. I came to graduate school and I was a little unprepared for graduate school. Yeah. And the first year that I was in graduate school, I really struggled. I didn't know if I was going to pass any of my classes. I mean, I came from being like a straight A student. So I, I, I really had a hard time. It was really a, a crisis moment for me. And I, I didn't, the, when you're in physics graduate school, you have to take this thing called a comprehensive exam, usually about a year or a year and a half into graduate school. If you don't pass that, they kick you out. So oh, you have man. to get past that exam. <laughs> and so I was, I was getting ready to take that exam and I really didn't know if I was going to be able to do it. And I had to sit down with myself and say, you know, this is what you love. Now you could, you could do this. And you have to buckle down and you basically have to relearn all the basic physics concepts that you maybe were a little, little shy on at the, the, the college you went to. Or you could go back home to Tennessee. You could work at the Cracker Barrel. You know, <laughs> you know like, so I really sat down and I said, this is the path you want. So buckle down and start studying. And I did. And that year I made the highest grade on the comprehensive out of all the other students. So I was super excited, but I basically had to start and I bought every single undergraduate textbook that, that was that the comps were based on. And I went through them. I cover to cover, I read them like novels and I did every problem in them. And that really prepared me for the comprehensive exam and kind of caught me back up with my peers in graduate school. So that's kind of a lesson is that sometimes, I mean, I, I was really passionate about physics, but I made a little bit of a misstep with where I went to college. Yeah. Always correct and come back. If you love something, you can always correct and come back and find your way again. Yeah. Well, it reminds me so much too of like my journey choosing art history <laughs> as my major when everybody was like, what? Why, why would you do that? But it seems like both you and I chose things that we couldn't not do. Like there was something in us that was like, you have to do this, even if it might not make sense, even if like there's 10 jobs in the world that do like that, that actually get to do this work. Like this is something that you just, you just feel like you had to do it. Right. But, and then even yeah. after you get your degree, you don't, I mean, like, I'm sure you found this career for yourself. You yeah. have, you have, you have carved out this career for yourself. And, and I feel the same. I mean, even after I graduated, it wasn't, you know, it, it, this is hard. I mean, this is a hard job to have and yeah. you really have to figure out how, what kind of career you want. And I, I guess when you're going through school, maybe this is something we should do better at teaching our children. But when yeah. you're going through school, it's very, your, your future is very clear. You know, first grade, second grade, second grade, third grade, third grade, fourth grade. Well, when you get to like college, you all of a sudden have to make some very big life choices that you don't get, you, you may not get a go back on. Like you, you get to yeah. choose a major and then you get to choose what you're going to do after that. And then you have to go to graduate school. You have to get a job. So there's, there's all these choices you make and the kind of the world splits. And it's really overwhelming to choose that path and to identify that path. 
and to, to really, you know, you're always trailblazing down the path you're going to go. So, yeah, I totally agree. Like you choose the things you, you, you can't not do. I hope the best thing in life is to have I mean, I shouldn't say that. The best thing in life is your children and your husband, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> the best thing in life is to have a career where you are fulfilled and that and a career that you fulfill. So I mean, you yeah. you get it both ways. I mean, I I if I I mean, even people that work at NASA, if they're working at NASA, but I can see that they're not enjoying their job or they're not maybe that good at their job, it makes me feel so sad for them because there's nothing better than having a job that matches you and you match it. And it just, it just this perfect mesh and it's just this beautiful thing. And so I feel like I found that, I know you found that for yourself and it's, it's really magical, but I couldn't tell you, I wish I could write down like how you get there. Right. Cause that's really the key part. How do you find that little niche where you fit? And, uh, but that's the the hard part, but when it, when you find it, you know, it, you want it, you stay there. You live yeah. it. And I think the answer is different for every person too. So that's why you can't really write a manual on it because every, right. everybody's journey is different. And you know, my daughter is in eighth grade and she's, you know, she's going into ninth next year. And in a few months, my school district that she's in, they have to choose a career path at ninth grade. <laughs> and, and well, in eighth grade, I guess for, to prepare for ninth. And I'm like, I don't, I don't like this idea at all because I, I feel like we, I mean, maybe it's good to prepare them, but it's also like, I feel like we give our like college students like so much pressure without a lot of information, you know, maybe I wouldn't have chosen our history if I knew like the max salary was in the 30,000s, you know, for certain jobs or college professors make it like $40,000 a year, like in F with a PhD, you know, right. Would I have done that? Had I known that? I don't, I think I probably still would have because I felt like I had to do it. So I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. So my daughter is in ninth grade now. So in Huntsville, we have this new school called, uh, gosh, ASCTE, Alabama School of Cyber Technology and Engineering. And it's a small school. It just started a few years ago. It's a public school, but it's for the whole state of Alabama. So you could, they're re- it's a residential school. So you could live oh, there. Wow. If, you, if you live far away, you can come and stay in the dorm. And my daughter applied and got in and now she's going to this school. So basically she has decided that she is a nerd. <laughs> she is a math <laughs> fan. And and it, I was really nervous about it because my daughter loves art. She's she's an amazing artist. I should send you some of her stuff. She's an amazing artist. She draws really cool, quirky characters and she's so good at it. She makes things. I mean, she's the sewer. She's she's so artistic. And she loves English. She's very creative. She does creative writing. And so I was really concerned putting her in this school, even though I thought it was a great opportunity. They get lots of cool stuff. It's a really, really, really neat school. But it is very limiting in terms of you're really focusing on science and math yeah. and engineering at the school. But so what we ended up doing was she takes she's in a club that does creative writing after school. And then we signed her up for an art class outside of school. We're going to sign her up for Japanese this summer. So we're trying to find other things to add to the school and not let the school be our only source of inspiration and only source of education. And find if she's passionate about other things, let her do other things too on the side or in after school activities. And I think there's, you can always, like I said, you can always go back. You can, you can make a choice and maybe it wasn't the best choice. And you can always say, okay, now I'm going to try something else. I'm going to do a different path and, I, and it, it will work. I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you're passionate about it and you keep pushing, even if you make maybe the wrong choice early, you can always correct. And I think a lot of kids, I was a college professor for about five years before I came to NASA and a lot of kids would come in as freshmen and say, I want to be a mechanical engineer. For some reason, like everybody wanted to be a mechanical engineer. <laughs> I guess there was something like going on. It probably was like salary, like U.S. News and World mm. Report said that mechanical engineers had the best salaries. So everybody said, I want to be a mechanical engineer. And they, know, they didn't know it required math. And so they came in <laughs> and they would take like, because I taught introductory physics. And so they would take introductory physics and they'd be like, there's a lot of math. There's a lot of math in this. And I'm like, oh, wait till you get to your engineering classes. <laughs> There's even more math. <laughs> so, but, you know, they just didn't know. And so I think yeah. it's it's good that your high school is already, it's kind of like letting them have a peak. Yeah, like, that's true. This, 
that, that they'll have in, in college if they go to a math career or they get to a science career or an English career. So it's, that part of it is, is actually good. And then they'll, maybe they'll know by the time they get to college, hey, that's not what I want to do. But I totally agree, though, about the salary thing, even though but it kind of kills me that our like our professors are so underpaid. I mean, I, I feel like I totally agree that that if you if you knew when you were very young um, what your what type of careers I mean, by young, I mean, age, what types of careers you could have and what the salary might be and what that impact would be for your life, uh, it might inform you to make a different decision. But do you love what you do? <laughs> Right. And so maybe, not. <laughs> maybe maybe you would have done something different and then, you know, you wouldn't have been been here. We wouldn't have this conversation today. I know. And as we're talking to, I think about, you know, a lot since this podcast up until recently was mostly just for teachers. I, a lot of my listeners are, are teachers. And I know, especially since COVID, that a lot of teachers are in the position of like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to, you know, they, they've lost that sort of spark and that love for it. And some of them, you know, wanted to be artists and they thought, okay, well, I'll be an art teacher. And uh, because how do you become an artist? And so I imagine that um, this conversation could be inspiring to those that, you know, maybe want to think about what that, what they are truly passionate about and, and inspire them to go for it. But Hey, we need great teachers. Yeah. We need great teachers. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, we don't want to send great off, teachers out of the classroom. <laughs> the, the one, the biggest underpaid, I mean, I say nurses and teachers are the professions yeah. that are the most underpaid mm-hmm. that we absolutely okay. need in our country. And hats off to great nurses and great teachers because I was, Indeed. I was so influenced by, uh, but the teachers in my life. And that's why I got here. I dedicated my PhD to my physics teacher from my mm. uh, that senior class I was talking about because she changed my life. She was a great teacher and she changed my life. She had such an impact. I wanted her to know that she had this huge impact. So all you teachers out there, you are having a huge <laughs> impact on your, yeah. on your kids' lives. So that's a calling too. I mean, that's an amazing Indeed. gift you're giving to people. Yeah, it is. All right. Let's go back to the art a little bit. Is there anything in there that um, that we haven't talked about that really is making you curious or ideas that you have about it? Well, I mean, I guess the other thing that kind of strikes me is that American flag. Yeah. And that that's you know the 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 shuttle program and 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 going to space. I mean, Americans actually weren't the first to do it, you know. So it's not that we we and we don't we don't have the the patent on that. Yeah, other other countries go to <laughs> go to space. So it's interesting that the American flag is there because obviously it's it's a very American thing. It's a very Americana painting too. Like you're saying, it's kind of yeah. Norman Rockwell esque. But it's interesting because I feel like space is something that could unite us. And I feel like mm. going to space and, and 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 going, it really gives you the sense of how small our Earth is, and how unimportant I I wish are some of our differences were. And mm-hmm. you know, and when 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 people or or countries or religion come between us and and we we threaten one another and that that but because of and you know because of national pride or because of religious pride or or whatever i i wish people could take a second and and think about us from space think about earth from space and and where we don't have borders and where we're just a we're, we're just these organisms on a on a rock shuttling through the universe and so yeah. i I, I I think it's interesting that the American flag is there. You know, obviously, I'm very proud of the of America's rocket program and America's space program, and it's I'm, hu- I'm a huge fan of my work for it. So I'm, I'm definitely proud yeah. of it. But um, but that's something that strikes me too is the American flag. Yeah, it's, it, you know, I I always think it's interesting that it seems to me that when I talk to people about how it feels to like look up, it's and, and, and realize how small you are in comparison to space. Some people think, oh gosh, I feel so small, but I, I feel the opposite. It just makes me feel like bigger and a part of something. And then when you were talking about looking down on earth, it it's like I saw in my head, like a, like an interconnected web of all the pe- all like little, little ties between all the people like cre- across the whole globe, creating like yes. what we are. And that, looking at a looking at humanity from above we all yeah it's like we're all one 
we're a bunch of little organisms. We're all like one moving, shifting thing. Yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a religious person and I, and I'm not a mystical person or a spiritual person <laughs> really, but, but I, I do think that as humanity, our sum is greater than our parts. Yeah. And so whatever that extra bit is that gives us that, you know, that, that we're greater than our, when we're together, we're greater than where we are individually. And, and that's something that I think a lot about, especially with the space program, because it takes a lot of people to make the space program. And so in any individual couldn't do it, but it takes this huge number of people to let us go into space. And so I think about that when we, when I think about, you know, if, I, I hesitate to use the word God, but when I think about God, I think about that God is that that space between us. If that's the relationship with other human beings, mm. that's where for me where where God is. I, f- I feel like we've been talking a lot about space and and the heavens, so we <laughs> might as well get religious on it. I know, of course. I, I it always ends up, you know, like to me, it the the line is so small to me between spirituality and science. And it was interesting as a child, not as, so I, I was raised Catholic and then I was the most fiercest atheist you'll meet for a long time. And then it, it's like, at some point, the more I knew, the more spiritual I got. And it's cause like, it was like, the more I knew, the more I realized I didn't know. And, and then all of a sudden I can like watch a, a, purely science documentary. I'm obsessed with science documentaries. So um, my Netflix is all just one science documentary after another, but like it to me is a spiritual experience because it's like, but I also agree that it's like, I don't really have a, like believe in quote unquote God, but I also like, yeah, God is in our connections between people. It's in like just our humanity. I don't know. It's like in each of us. So I love that. God is in the space between us. I'm going to write that down. That feels like something <laughs> I need to write down. <laughs> See, and I always think, science. You know, I, Einstein talked a lot about doing thought experiments, and he would, he, mm-hmm. you know, when he was talking about relativity. And I wish I, I, I feel like I'm going to misquote this and or, or say this wrong. So he's talking about doing because I haven't I haven't thought about relativity in a long time. But he was talking about relativity and he was thinking about relativity. He was thinking about what if you were on a train or on a chair and he was moving and he was moving faster and faster and getting closer to the speed of light. So he was kind of moving at you could kind of see here's the light moving and he's like moving at that same speed. And he was talking about thinking about that. And at one point he was saying that he was at like he's looking at the face of God like that was. Because he was just seeing what he couldn't see. He was just, he mm-hmm. was like right there, you know. And and I just thought that was such a powerful idea as we learn and we learn and we learn and we can kind of see what we don't know. And so that's yeah. kind of like looking at that, you know, quote unquote, face of God, where you're 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 seeing the edges of our knowledge. And I, and I'm, I obviously Einstein was a ma- like a one of a kind and, and it has, yeah. Einstein is very uh, inspirational. If you like read some of his writings and some of the things he said, listen to some of the things he said, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And then it, that, what you just said made me think of back, back to our, uh, what we were talking about truth. And that it's just like, that truth is just, was like just beyond him. And so like, exactly. In, exactly. in that place, the face of God is truth. Uh, right. Oh, well, right. There's like connections all over the place. Here. <laughs> I love it. Do, oh, okay. Do all your podcasts get this deep? Or, or- <laughs> they, they, a lot of them do. <laughs> <laughs> that's what art brings out. <laughs> that's what art brings out. Not all of them, but yeah, you know. Yeah. I love a deep conversation. That's why I do it because uh yeah. I don't think we have enough deep conversations in in life. So I agree. This has been really neat. Yeah, it's been super fun. And I think so we, we've been talking for for about an hour now, so we probably should wrap it up. Is there anything you feel left unsaid about the painting that you want to comment on before we Wrap up. No, I just wish we still had the shuttle program because I would love to go see another shuttle launch. I mm-hmm. saw one when I was a kid, but I haven't, you know, I, that was obviously the shuttle was retired. I think very soon after I joined NASA, I mean, before I joined NASA. Yeah. So I haven't seen another one, but yeah, that's it. I mean, the the clock that's there, I mean, that's as, as again, as somebody who goes to the rocket launches, they always have a big clock and that's yeah. really exciting. And, uh, you know, I can't express to you how exciting it is when you see seen that clock go down and you're and the person over the PA is T minus 10, nine, 
eight, you know, and it's just, oh, it's all building oh. and after the launch is happening. And it's just, and, and you almost forget that time keeps going. I mean, you were just paying so much careful attention to time, mm -hmm. 10, 9, 8, 7, and then the launch happens and then time continues. And and at, at Saturday Market launches, at least, the person that did the countdown will count up, but she only counts like every 10 or 20 seconds. She goes plus 10, plus 20. And, mm. and, and you're like, I don't know, like time was moving so slow when you're getting ready for launch. And then as soon as launch happened, everything starts accelerating. Yeah. That's like uh, the relativity again. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> is oh, is there anything in the, in the painting for you that, that, that you feel is? No, I think this was perfection. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know um, what we would talk about, but I am so glad that we got to talk. I, that was such a treat for me. So, well, Thank, thank goodness you chose this painting. This is amazing. I, I feel like I feel like this was the perfect painting for us to talk about. Yeah. I, I'm really, uh, you know, I'm surprised by it. But I'm, like I said, I'm gonna find a, a I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to purchase a, a print of it so I can hang it up. Yeah. Okay. Is there anywhere? Uh, I know a lot of times I have like business owners on here who have socials that people can follow. Do you have anything like that? I do have a Twitter that I, uh, and I don't even remember what it is. I think it's just Amy R. Weinberger, um, my, my name, but you can Google me and find it on Twitter. And I post there when I'm at a launch. So I never okay. post except if I'm at a launch. So I, but I, when I'm at a launch or in, in the field, getting ready for a launch, I'll post there. And so if people want to follow me and get the excitement of what it's to be at, like at a launch, that's a place you can look for me. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so very much. Thanks, Cindy. It was great to catch up. Thank you so much for listening to Art and Self. And if you loved what you heard, please consider leaving me a rating or a review on iTunes. And share this episode with one friend who you know needs to hear what we talked about today. You will find links to the artworks that we discuss over at the show notes at artandself.com. And you can also join my email list to get notified of all of the new upcoming episodes. The videos of these episodes are also available over on YouTube at Art and Self. And you can also follow me on social media on Instagram at Art and Self and on Facebook at Art and Self Cindy. Thank you so much for listening and have a wonderful week. I'll see you next time.